welcome. I see that we have folks coming onto the call. This is Anissa Avon with Turnkey Coaching Solutions, and I want to thank David Whitmarsh with the Whitmarsh Consulting Group for having us on the webinar today. Um, also on the call, we have Annie Kirschenman, who I'll introduce you guys to here shortly. Um, our goal today is to talk about the five behaviors of a cohesive team and how that model um, based on the New York Times best-selling book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, um, is really making waves and producing some pretty impressive results in uh, the fine art of team development and um, building cohesive, effective teams and organizations. So. Um, Thank you, everyone, for being here. As we move forward, if you have questions, um, of course, there is a question box there on the GoToWebinar. Don't hesitate to submit your questions. We would love to have that kind of interactivity. Um, if uh, you have any technical challenges, let us know. Leanne is on the call with us as well, and she works with the Whitmarsh Group, and she'll be helping us manage any questions and the polls that we have here shortly and all that good stuff. So um, to get right down to the meat of this, I'd like to begin by talking just a little bit about the five behaviors and um, how our work at Turnkey Coaching Solutions. So uh, what we're going to talk about today are cohesive teams. And uh, I have seen the five behaviors of a cohesive team, uh, again, uh, based on Patrick Lencioni's bestseller, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Of course, that uh, amazing fable that you can you can finish in an airplane ride across the country or, or even a couple of hours and uh, has sold millions of copies around the world. But what has been developed from that seminal work is this pretty impressive model that is an assessment-based model uh, to support organizations and really putting their finger on the pulse of where are we as a team, are we really as good as we think we are, or opposite, are we really as bad as we think we are, and what do we need to do about it, what are the best practices in team development. So Annie, in a moment I'm going to share with uh, folks a little bit more about who you are and, and, and how you and I have come to know each other and a little bit about Turnkey, but can you kind of give us a, an overview in your experience about cohesive teams? Why, why are we having this conversation? Why is this conversation important? Well, <laughs> thank you, Anissa. Great to be here. Hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, that's a, a big question. Um, Patrick Lencioni puts it into a nutshell. Um, what he says is that, and I think you have a slide uh, about this later, but what Patrick says is that, um, that good teamwork, excellent teamwork is actually the um, most competitive edge that um, a company can have. So in a nutshell, um, why we're here and why we want high-functioning teams, um, in particular high-functioning leadership teams, is uh, because it makes the company more effective, more profitable, and more highly competitive. Yeah. Yeah. I think in a nutshell, that's a, that's a pretty good <laughs> nutshell. Um, certainly in our experience of working with the five behaviors inside organizations, um, uh, oftentimes when we start an engagement, the level of discord and dysfunction has become the norm um, to the point at which there is almost a disbelief that it, it could be different. They have learned to succeed in spite of the discord, the dysfunction, the the unproductive conflict. Um, what has been your experience with that? Well, I, I think that is unfortunately um, all too true in in organizations. Uh, again, Lencioni says teamwork is is probably one of the most important things we can do in in terms of um, organizational development uh, and leadership and, and team development. And uh, my experience matches uh, exactly what you're saying, that people get used to it. And, um, and you know, we don't know that we could um, do anything more effectively or, or perhaps more importantly, we don't know where to start or yes. what to actually do about it. Um, and that's one of the beauties of, of this program. Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is just, um, just the most elegant um, team development program that, that I've ever worked with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And and I, w I would agree. Um, we've worked with a number of, um, we'll just call it disparate uh, formats and models, and they all have good theory. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, I felt that the results um, were lackluster. The results themselves require the teams to figure out how to adopt let's say constructive conflict or how to develop trust amongst each other whereas this model um, the five behaviors of a cohesive team actually walks them through a facilitated process to in fact make better faster decisions founded on the five principles. So why don't we get into a little bit here's that quote that you were talking about not finance mm -hmm. not strategy not technology it is teamwork that remains the ultimate competitive advantage both because it is so powerful and so rare Patrick Lencioni. So, um, and, and we should point out too that that's a very recent quote so his, his, the five dysfunctions of a team has been um, a business bestseller perennially for um, at least a decade I'm not remembering exactly when it when it was published but that quotes recent so he's still seeing that even though um, that book has been out there and he's been working with teams in that time yes my understanding is is now he has somewhat empirical evidence yeah. <laughs> of the, the truthfulness uh, the accuracy of that fact it, it um, does indeed yes <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about our goals for today. Um, we've got a number of folks on the call. If you're just joining us, thank you for joining us. This is Anissa Avon, and I have on the call with me Annie Kirschenman. And um, so we're going to learn about the five behaviors of a cohesive team. Uh, we're going to discover how and why companies are using the model to develop productive, high-performing teams. And, and as we move forward, if, if we're not using... Um, specific enough examples or if we're referring to something and you'd like to know a little bit more don't hesitate to to give us some challenging questions um, I would love to have some some real meat in this conversation so um, we're going to learn about how either the disc or the MBTI styles influence an employee's behavior and those uh, of you on the call who've used either uh, know that it does influence an employee's behavior but our frame today is how does it influence behavior in a team and and it doesn't matter. Is that something that can be useful in closing the divide in, in, in effective teamwork versus ineffective? Um, we're going to talk just briefly on how to measure the team's effectiveness, and then we're going to explore very high level. We don't have enough time today, but we're going to explore a few strategies for building a cohesive team. So uh, lots of goals to accomplish. Do you have anything to add to that, Annie? I, I think that's um, a, a lot to chew in a short period of time. So. <laughs> yeah, good analogy, but we're going to run with it. It must be lunchtime. <laughs> so there are the. Let me first introduce Annie. I'm. Uh, I've worked with Annie uh, with Turnkey Coaching Solutions. Um, Gosh, at least a decade now. Yeah. Um, I can't even remember, but it was maybe 2004, 2005 when we first met. And mm -hmm. Annie uh, has worked with a number of Turnkey's clients, and always gets the you know the 4.9 and 5 point rating on her training and executive coaching program. So, um, anytime I'm I'm privileged enough to have you on a call with me, Annie, I feel like I learned something. So. Annie is a board certified coach. She has 20 plus years of business and leadership development experience. She's a former CEO herself, um, decided to make a transition into the, the learning and development and executive coaching and training realm. Uh, and has been actually training and coaching since the 1990s. Um, what's really interesting about Annie's niche is she started in the creative arts world and used what she learned as an as a creative artist, as an artist. And correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Annie was a dancer. Is that right? Correct. Yes. Yes. As a, as a professional dancer in her background in the creative arts in that way. And used that knowledge and now has a thriving practice teaching organizations how to be how to bring forth innovation, creative thinking, 
um, and still manage risks inside uh, various uh, and varied industries. Um, she is an accredited facilitator for the Five Behaviors of a Cohesive Team and one of the rare few across the world that's actually been using the program month after month since its initial launch in 2014. Anna, you were even a part of the beta, pro beta program proving the model. Is that accurate? And that is that is not. I was not um, uh, a part of the beta, but I oh, okay. picked it up right as it became um, uh, generally available. Okay, I remember you were involved from the very beginning, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and have participated in walking a number of organizations through the model. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have. So uh, a little bit about myself. This is my least favorite part about webinars is having to talk about me. Um, I really prefer to talk about the expertise of my coaches and um, the really phenomenal things that I get to be a part of. Um, I have personally been um, consulting and coaching since 1997. Prior to that, I was doing business consulting. Prior to that, I was um, dissatisfied working for others, so I pretty much was a serial entrepreneur through um, high school and then college and um, have always looked for ways to collaborate with other like-minded folks to um, bring progressive ideas uh, in particular in business. My father was an antique uh, auction. Uh, auctioneer and an antique dealer and I used to travel around the country with him um, in his business and uh, I think I just I got bit I, I got the bug <laughs> for business and then that was it for me but I'm very proud of what we're doing here at Turnkey Coaching Solutions we're providing affordable learning and development solutions um, that are scalable and single point of contact uh, and on top of that our metrics and objective oversight allow organizations to see how it's exactly their training dollars impact the bottom line. Everything that we do, um, my team is uh, probably buried in surveys because we are constantly looking for how can we validate that the work that we're doing is, is having an impact. So that's a little bit about me and about um, Turnkey. Um, Annie, give us a high level overview. Talk to us a little bit more about the five behaviors. What is it? How, how did it come about? What's important about it? Okay. Well, you, you can see from this slide the, the, the major bullet points. Um, as we've already mentioned, the five behaviors of a cohesive team is based on the five dysfunctions of a team. What is new about this, uh, if uh, people are familiar with uh, the book, Five Dysfunctions, or perhaps you've even worked with um, uh, some of the training programs that were um, initially based on the five dysfunctions by the table group or um, generally available. Uh, this has taken the model and it's kind of flipped it into um, uh, what competencies are we actually attempting to develop on, on the team. So it, it puts it in a frame of uh, not so much dysfunction, but what's the what? It, what do we need to do in order to be functional? Uh, Patrick Lencioni was, um, of course, in the center of developing uh, this program, so it has uh, all of his knowledge uh, and um, experience from five dysfunctions of the team, plus um, the uh, expertise that Wiley. Uh, brings to bear in in terms of uh, creating assessments. So, uh, as as you have mentioned, and the bullet point here says it's it's assessment based. So we're we're taking it um, either from uh, it, well DISC or um, the all types. The MBTI uh, assessments are uh, embedded into uh, the assessment. Uh, and team members answer not only questions about themselves and their particular approaches or their different style preferences, they also answer questions about the team. So uh, we get a picture from the report not only of the individuals on the team but also the team as a whole. And as you say, it's uh, facilitated active learning. It's a it's a hands-on process. There is nothing theoretical <laughs> about this other than um, you know the the content and the the research that that backs it up. Absolutely, and I, I can speak from uh, speaking with clients who are new to the model initially. 
um, when they hear it's a facilitated active learning process, um, they, their takeaway is that's fantastic because we know that facilitated processes or active learning is a best practice that's going to uh, maximize our investment. And then they're thinking, okay, this is a one-day endeavor <laughs> or, you know, a day and a half. We can spare a day and a half. And, and the truth is, is it would be fantastic if we could go in there and really knock the ball, knock you know, knock it out of the park with a day and a half. But what what has been your experience with what uh, the expectations are versus what actually happens in a in a facilitated process? Yeah, yeah. So um, it, it's it's complicated, of course, as as everybody who is listening today knows, because teams, in particular, leadership teams, executive teams, don't have a whole heck of a lot of spare time um, to be uh, you know to be doing development. I mean, that's just a fact of life. This is um, uh, a a very specific program uh, designed uh, to be delivered over the course of three to five days. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be all at once, of course, um, it can be split up, and it, in fact, it's uh, often uh, delivered in this way. But the team really does need to be ready to dive in and do some, some heavy lifting. So even though the model is very simple, it's very straightforward, very easy to get your arms around, uh, it's, it's deep work um, for, for the team. Um, it, it, as you can imagine, looking, looking at the slide right now, um, we're, we're starting to talk about what are the five competencies that we are looking to develop in this program. This, this is not small stuff. Um, you know, developing trust, uh, on a team, again, even though the definition of trust and, and how we're looking at it, how we're approaching it is very straightforward. Um, it, anybody uh, who is listening knows that, that trust is a precious commodity and it... Well, can't we uh, just do a ropes course for that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, yes, you can. And, <laughs> and, then, and then we'll all trust each other after that. We'll do some right. trust. Yeah, we're, we're talking about embedding these uh, behaviors, these competencies, if you will, into a culture. And as my, I am a fan of ropes courses, don't yes. get me wrong, <laughs> I think they're yeah. some great stuff. Um, but we're, we're talking about embedding this in real time, in, in the real world, in, uh, you know, in, a, in a team, in a, in a company, in a culture. Yeah. 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 Very good. So, Let's see. There was a video I was going to show, um, but it, we couldn't get it to work uh, in our test run. So why don't we move into? I'd like to um, uh, ask you guys that are out there um, a couple of questions about your experience um, with Teams. And before we begin, I just want to address um, a question that has actually come in um, from. I can't actually see the asker. I may not be reading this correctly. Um, okay, uh, will this, let me ask you this, and um, while we're asking this question, Leanne, if you would help us, we're going to run a poll, and we're going to, if you would, the poll is open now, we've got a couple of questions for you, um, so the question is, and then I'm going to read off the question from uh, the participant that's asked, when coworkers admit their mistakes, where to go? Uh, does it make you trust them more? So when coworkers admit their mistakes, does it make you trust them more? If you would answer that poll, in a moment we'll have your answer and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the other question while we're waiting on that is Annie, um, someone from, it looks like maybe Fort Worth, but I'm unable to see it. It says, will this address virtual teams too or only in person? Uh, as the program is designed, it is designed for in-person facilitation. Uh, again, the uh, this is not; these are not small things we're, we're working with. Tr you know, developing trust, um, the ability to engage in productive conflict. Uh, uh, all of these things are it's it's really meaty. Uh, so this particular program, again, as it's designed, does does not work well with virtual teams delivered virtually. Um, it, 
if I'm if I'm understanding the question correctly, that that's what um, that's what the participant is asking. Can we you know can we deliver it virtually? I if think what, actually the question, uh, and that may have been it, but my understanding of the question is, will it work for teams who work together virtually, yes, even absolutely. if they have to come yes. together in person? Yes. Uh -huh. Absolutely, it will work for for teams that work together virtually, and in fact, it's a great tool for teams that work to together virtually, it needs to be delivered in person. Again, the way it was, was designed. You can do a kind of high-level um, overview of the program in a virtual format, but not, again, that, that may be heavy lifting for mm -hmm. the team. Mm -hmm. and, and that's been my experience as well. I have um, seen organizations, um, now as the program is designed, it's for intact teams who work together. Um, I have seen organizations use it for decision-making teams, um, global executive uh, teams um, uh, that may not necessarily, they may come together as more of a um, several times a year uh, executive team overview of strategy and where the company is, or where the country, <laughs> where the country, where the company is. I, th there was no Freudian slip there, folks. So <laughs> where where the company is headed, um, and even though the model is for getting in there and working on the teamwork for teams who are actively engaged on a regular basis, delivering results for a specific goal. Um, I have seen companies use this model uh, and this facilitation even when it's the executive team who may not be charged with individual operational teamwork, but as a leadership teamwork, I've seen it work very well as well. Um, the, the facilitator has to typically um, change the model, not change the model, change the facilitated uh, dialogue uh, just enough to make it relevant for their level of interactivity. Has that been your experience? Yes, that that can work. So it, it's it's a um, it, it's a program that that can be adapted. Uh, again, I'm I'm speaking to how it was originally designed, and and um, in in my opinion, as well as in the the research that's available on it, delivers the most impactful results. Yes. Yes. So we have the, the results are in. So for you guys that are on the call, 95% uh, say yes when coworkers admit their mistakes. Uh, does it make you trust them more? You guys said 95% uh, of you said yes, 5% said no. Um, the greater research um, from all of the number of organizations that participated in the um, pool of, in the research, um, it was about 84% yes. So. Um, uh, that was a number of years ago when this particular research study was done, but we're we're still within that ten percent margin. That yeah, that's very interesting, and and we should also point out that again, the five behaviors of a cohesive team is is targeting specific behaviors, um, and being able to admit mistakes uh, and and discuss them as a team is one of the things that contributes to trust on a team, uh, according to the model. I think that's a, a good point. Here's our next uh, survey question. It's about conflict. Do you think your workplace would be more effective if people were more frank with their opinions? So while you guys are answering that, the poll's in progress now. Um, what about you, Annie? What what have you found in regards to this conflict piece? Uh, the idea of being direct and authentic, uh, uh, you know, there's an entire now genre of leadership training that is just around uh, authentic leadership, for example. But talk to us a little bit about constructive conflict versus, well, destructive, destructive conflict, conflict. <laughs> right? Or, or conflict in general. How does this model support that? It, it, it's again remembering that each of the behaviors build on each other. So, in order to um, for a team to be able to engage in productive conflict in the way that that Lencioni defines it and and talks about it, the team first has to be able to to trust each other. So, you know, if you don't have trust um, on a team, you're less likely to have um, productive conflict. 
uh -huh. and more likely to have destructive conflict. Um, one of you know the things that that Lencioni stresses and that we work uh, a lot with in uh, the facilitated training is focusing conflict and the discussions um, or the debates, if you will, around ideas. So you know it's it's not about it, it's not about conflict between people. It's about a healthy debate of of ideas. And um, one of the things that Lancioni says is that if a team is not able to have productive conflict around ideas, it will have destructive conflict um, between people. And, and so, again, we're building with this model. So the, the um, trust is first, has to be in place. Um, and then once trust is there, a team is much more likely to be able to develop the capacity for this kind of productive conflict. Mm. So I should have asked this question when we were when we were on the trust model, but trust, what is it that actually builds trust? I mean, how do you know trust has been built? what are what are the elements where a team knows that they trust one another? How does that work? Yeah. So again, briefly, it's it's a it, it's a big module in the, in the program. <laughs> but but briefly, and and um, people may be familiar with this if you've read Five Dysfunctions or done any work with Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Uh, Lencioni draws a big distinction between what he calls predictability-based trust um, and vulnerability-based trust. So predictability-based trust is um, if I've worked with you for a while, Anissa, and I say X, I can be pretty sure you're going to say Y or you're going to respond in, in a certain way. Um, and most teams would say that they have a certain level of predictability-based trust. Mm -hmm. um, vulnerability-based trust, on the other hand, is the um, ability to be reasonably professionally vulnerable with your teammates to to be able to um, ask for help to say things like I'm in over my head I you know I need help here to offer help um, to admit that you've made mistakes to apologize so so these are the, the the kinds of specific behaviors that we're seeking to develop in in the trust module and and what Lencioni says is that when teams trust each other that you know intentions are basically good, um, then they're they're much more likely to be able to engage in uh, conflict, productive conflict that serves the the team and and the goals of the team. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, so the the poll is in, the results are in, so to speak, um, for you guys that are on the call with us. Um, eighty one percent said yes. We think that the work like workplace would be more effective if people were more frank with their opinions. Nineteen percent said no. Um, when any for you guys, when you get folks to this place of constructive conflict. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and, uh, oh, I'm sorry, let me answer that question as far as the greater research. It was 75, 70, hello, where, there we go, 75%. 70. <laughs> <That's it, yeah. laughs> uh, yes, yes, said yes. So 81% on this call, 71% within the greater research group. What has been your experience when teams find a way to be frank and still respectful, to speak their speak and have conflict around ideas. What what happens to those groups? Oh, it's it's stunning. I mean, they are uh, not only so much more productive; they make much better decisions because the the team has the ability to air all their thoughts about it, all their ideas. Uh, and it, it's, it, of course, when you have more uh, thoughts and ideas on the table, there's more to choose from. Uh, there's, you know, a, a, a much greater percentage of decisions that are going to be that are going to be better, better decisions. Mm -hmm. So this is really, really, again, it's really important to the model that people are able to express their opinions. Um, uh, most of the teams that I've worked with around this develop. Um, uh, 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 well, they refer to it in different ways, but let's just call it a conflict culture on the team, where when a when a major, especially a major decision is being debated, they have a 
uh, a culture, a credo, if you will, of, of no passes. Mm -hmm. you, everybody on the team must weigh in with, with their opinion, and, they, and mm -hmm. a lot of teams do that in a very you know, systematic way, going around the room, for example. Um, but it's, uh, it, it's a really, it's, it's the ability to do this now, it, of course, makes it, it possible for the team to do the other behaviors in, in yeah. the model. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, uh, well said. We um, there was a comment from someone who's on the attendee list, and and they said regarding uh, this question, my team is already frank, so my vote is more in a <laughs> than no. Any more frankness, and there would be conflict. Uh, yeah. what, how do you work with teams who, perhaps, if we were to talk in the disc language, high D's, driving for results, we're going to speak our mind. You guys just need to get on board because we're to get things done. <laughs> How do you work with teams that, and, and I see a lot of, frankly, uh, leadership teams who have um, a, a aggressive or assertive, aggressive isn't the right word, assertive individuals who are very frank, um, mm. and yet what happens to those other members of the team who perhaps are not as direct or forthcoming in their immediate opinions? What happens to the effectiveness or the productivity or the, the collaboration process for the other members of the team? Yes, well, there's a lot that could be said about that. I, I, I think what Lencioni would say is that the, those teams are not engaging in productive conflict. So the, the, one of the, um, the tools, if you will, or, or concepts that we use in the conflict model uh, module is what Lencioni refers to as the conflict continuum. And so there's two extremes on that continuum, just to put it simplistically. One is artificial harmony, where mm -hmm. nothing really important ever gets talked about. And the other extreme is what, what I think our participant is referring to, is that people are just really mean-spirited and you know, it's kind of hell, if you will, <laughs> in, a, in a team meeting. So what, what we're looking for here is, to, is to, for a team to live right in the middle of that. So you know, there's uh, enough trust. And, and enough respect that, that te people can you know, speak, speak their opinions, know they're going to be heard, um, they are going to be respectful for, for the most part, um, and uh, you know, so we're developing the capacity to live in that center place of, of the continuum, if you will. Wow. Uh, and you called that the um, continuum the con of... The conflict continuum is, is uh -huh. how Lencioni refers to it. That work with teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I've not never done this program with teenagers. <laughs> whole new, whole new experience. <laughs> uh, well, we have uh, an, another question I'd like to um, pose to the group for the survey, and and while you guys are answering this question, um, we have a number of questions that have come in. Um, for the participants that I want to read off to you, Annie. Um, okay. So this is a this next survey question is about commitment. Um, do you sometimes feel that team projects suffer because people aren't committed enough? Do you sometimes feel that team projects suffer because people aren't committed enough? So um, we're going to open up that poll as well. Um, there you I go. See it coming in. Yeah. Oh, good deal. Um, so, uh, Annie, I want to ask a couple of questions. Um, sure. Okay, there are a couple here. Let me see. Um, so, one of the questions is from uh, Carlos Gomez says, who should take the role in leading this workshop? Is it um, the HR professional? Should it be a uh, team leader? Both. If HR, uh, should those facilitators all have pre-existing relationships with all participants? Mm. So that, that's an excellent question, uh, and it goes to um, uh, dis decisions that um, individual companies uh, need to, to make about this. So let me just say a few things uh, about that. Uh, it is not a recommended best practice for the team leader to facilitate this program. Mm -hmm. um, whether you're hiring a, a facilitator 
from outside your company or you've got someone from your you know your um, organizational development department or HR who, who delivers it the team leader um, needs to be involved he or she needs to be in there with the team rolling up uh, rolling up the sleeves and and doing the work and um, to a, a large extent a large extent excuse me modeling each of these behaviors again to the best of, of his or her ability mm -hmm. so um, it, 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 it creates a, um, an undesirable division uh, if the team leader facilitates the, the program. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, in um, the book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, uh, the fable includes the facilitation uh, by a leader. Um, and we have certainly seen, in, in our work, uh, we have seen some team leads um, take the lead. Um, and, and I can remember uh, one uh, opportunity when we were consulting around the model, um, the other members of the team uh, going to the, the trainer and saying, uh, let me tell you why this is not working. Because every time he'll ask a question, he'll, be, he'll say, who doesn't agree with me? <laughs> exactly. so and, and everyone's like, "Oh, really? Am I am I am I going to take that bait? Is it just going to be me on the line here?" So, um, uh, it's it's um, uh, it's a sometimes reality. I'm sure everybody can relate to it. Sometimes the the team leader um, is the person who needs the work the most. So, um, yes. so it's another reason um, to uh, to have the team leader be a participant in the process. Not okay not the facilitator of it. Yeah. Now what I have seen is many organizations um, will that use this model want to then take the five behaviors and cascade it down through their organization. Um, and, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on this and then um, I want to share a question. Stephanie um, Norvasis perhaps uh, has asked, will you be sharing any content regarding building teams or will you be focusing on discussing the benefits of your program? So good question Stephanie. Our intention was to talk uh, about the model and um, about how the model builds teams, but one of the things that I think uh, I'd like to, to ask Annie is what is um, a, a specific manner in which someone could take these five behaviors, for example, and support their team in having, in building greater trust or uh, um, generating a comfort around constructive conflict. Uh, how would you go about uh, now, in my experience, I don't know how to ask this question because in my experience, we just mentioned, you know, does a team lead do this or an expert facilitator, right, or an outside. Mm -hmm. What is something that someone can take away our time together today that they can actually use uh, around building teams and, and teamwork? Yeah, so it's a, it's a great question. And uh, the simplest response that I can give, um, given our time, is to have everybody on the team uh, read the, the five dysfunctions of a team and, and have discussions around it. Yeah. And um, there's some suggested activities uh, in there or things that you read that, um, you know, that that particular uh, fictitious team is engaging. Um, you can, you know, you can do some of those things, or talk about it, or you know, just having a conversation on a, uh, on your team about trust is is powerful. Yeah. So uh, if you're not in a position to to do a facilitated process, that is um, one relatively accessible way that that you could get the conversation started. Yeah, that, that's really good. And, and as we move forward, I, I'd like to continue the, the piece of the puzzle regarding, okay, what have you learned in regards to, um, in a moment I'm going to share with everyone the answer, uh, the poll results for this question around commitment. Um, and uh, after I do that, Annie, I'd like for you to answer the question regarding um, an activity that's involved in the facilitated process that actually supports the team in understanding their current level of commitment mm -hmm. and shifting their level of commitment. What's an activity um, in that regard? So hold that answer for a moment. So um, the results of our poll uh, for the greater group that's with us today, do you sometimes feel that team projects suffer because people aren't committed enough? 89% uh, uh, of you guys on the call today said yes. 
Sometimes we feel that team projects suffer because people aren't committed enough. 11% said no. The greater research group, 86% said yes, so very much on par with our folks on the webinar today, um, said yes, we feel like our projects suffer. So let's go to that commitment activity. What is some, what occurs in that facilitated process or what's something that a, a team lead could take away from our call today? Mm. So, yeah, good stuff. Um, the, it, again, remember we're building, so, uh, it, you know, a team that has trust and, and has been able to engage in a productive conflict means that everybody's had a chance to express their opinions. Um, and so the, the commitment behavior, the competency that we're looking at here, um, is that people will be able to commit to a decision even if they initially disagreed with it. And uh, what Lencioni says about this is, you know, a team that, that where members can't weigh in are not going to buy in. And, and of course that's what commitment is, is all about, is, is buying in and supporting the team decisions no matter how you initially felt about it. Yeah. And so we, we do a number of activities in the facilitated program uh, about creating buy-in uh, and uh, you know how a, a, a team will negotiate that. Uh, the, uh, it's, I think it's important to understand that you know there are a, uh, a lot of activities embedded in the, in the facilitation that are about the teams choosing. Um, what kind of culture they want to develop. So even even though there are you know very specific kinds of concepts that we're working with here, not every team will do conflict in the same way. Not every team will do commitment in the same way. So it's you know it's a lot of the questions about well you know what what's acceptable to, to this team. What kind of culture do you, do you want to develop? And um, so we do um, activities around buy-in in, in this module. Uh, we, we discuss as a team how do you want to seal the deal, how do you know that everybody is on board and you don't have someone who's harboring um, some you know, unexpressed uh, opinion. And what that looks like from team to team is, is uh, of course, different. Mm -hmm. it's similar, it's the same competency, but it shows up differently on, on the different so you're really um, talking about talking. The, the facilitated process is conversation facilitated over a period of time in order to get to um, a, a place of, are you saying group consensus? Are no, you saying, no, no, it's not consensus. In fact, <laughs> she only would say that's a dirty word. Um, okay. Good. <laughs> commitment is not about consensus. It's about buy-in. And it, it, again, in this model, so um, it, it, you know what we're what we're looking for here is that you know team members trust each other uh, enough. They're going to share their opinions, and they are going to go with the will of either the team leader or the group after they have been able to engage in this, even if they disagreed with um, the 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 choice. So again, pretty it's pretty meaty stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the book talks about it, um, Five Dysfunctions of a Team, and again, and again if, if you know, there, there are people on the um, uh, webinar today who, f who want a starting place, I, the book is the go-to place. Mm -hmm. You can have some great conversations um, around mm -hmm. the, the story mm -hmm. in, in the book. You know, and, and um, so we're going we're gonna to ask another question in a poll, um, and while we're doing that, Annie, I want, I want you to think about, uh, there's been lots of team building training ideas, mm. right, and mm. trainers who go out and their entire job is to break down walls and, and support uh, a team in becoming more productive. And um, I have a, a trainer who does this incredible on the golf course team mm -hmm. training event. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's an incredible Yummy. Experience, right? <laughs> it's Yummy, a full yeah. day of golf and a full day of leadership <laughs> development. And by the time they're done, they have, you know, the perfect tan and, you know, they've just really come together as <laughs> Um, so what's the difference in, say, a team building activity, like mm -hmm. golf, 
or ropes, uh, a ropes course, or you know any number of activity, and the outcome of that versus an outcome of, of this dialogue that you're talking about. I mean, I'm not hearing you say, hey, we're going to get together and we're going to build an, a roller coaster out of marbles and paper clips. <laughs> no, that, that's right? not a part of this program. And, and not to diss any of that. I, I love all that stuff. That I is so too. cool. And I, and I this, think it's effective for what it does. It is effective. Yes. Absolutely. So, you know, like anything, this is a very specific program with a specific kind of application. And um, it, it depends. You know, the answer is, well, it depends. I mean, what, what does this particular team you know what's going to be most impactful for for them, and maybe maybe it is a ropes thing or or a, a, the <laughs> fabulous golf thing that you, that you're talking about, Seriously, and yeah. and and maybe it's this. So you know we have um, uh, some questions that we typically ask the the team leader HR, um, you know, to see whether or not this is a fit for for the team or teams that that they have in mind, and it isn't going to be a fit. Again, the way it, it's designed, it, it wouldn't be a fit for everybody. I got you. It looks like we're, we had a little bit of a technical challenge. The um, screen uh, stopped showing for a minute, so hopefully we're back on. Um, the I see couple, it now. Okay, good. I apologize. I may have hit something. Uh, it says, uh, okay, does say that we're on. Um, and also, I hear a, some of you guys are having trouble with the sound. Uh, I apologize for that. I'm not sure what to do about it. What I can say is that we are recording this, so that perhaps um, if you find it valuable, you'll be able to listen to the recording, and and we will. Uh, the Whitmarsh Consulting Group will make that available. A um, couple of things I want to add uh, from our listeners. Um, Bob Lorenzo says, I found his other book called The Advantage, um, which is also a phenomenal read, and I agree, Bob. Uh, I really enjoyed um, so, book. <laughs> all of it. The Advantage is good. Um, the Ideal Team Player is good. Um, and probably once every 18 months or so, I read The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Um, for my own team and purposes of uh, working with the, that model um, for more than just my team. I, I frankly try to do that with my teenagers. <laughs> Build trust, get some commitment. No, I, yeah, so, um, so, so sure. the advantage, yes, I, I will just add to, to underscore that. The advantage is another great resource and, and it, it is. Um, somewhat more geared to practical application of, of yeah. the concepts, so, so that's another great resource for you, and thank you for mentioning it, because um, it is Absolutely. terrific. I agree, and Shar Fortune has a question, or has a comment and question about uh, accountability, so I'm going to reveal real quick our uh, survey question, and um, after that I'm going to, well, reverse that different order. Here's Char's question. You think about this, Annie. Then I'm going to reveal the survey answer, and then we'll come back to Char's question. Char is saying, if team members choose to be involved on a team and don't complete tasks or projects agreed to, how do you make them accountable? <laughs> I love the question. Thank uh, you. Okay. <laughs> so our uh, so on our group here, two percent said no. Uh, would your team work be more effective if people were better at holding one or another accountable? Maybe that that two percent. You guys are already effective at holding each other accountable, um, or accountability isn't an issue. One or the other. Um, and ninety-eight percent yes, the teamwork would be more. The team would work more effectively if we were better at holding one another accountable. And for the greater research group. Let me get to, there we go, 89% uh, said yes, so 98% on our call today and 89% uh, of the, for the research from prior, um, the Lencioni group and the Wiley uh, research that's done before. So back to Char's uh, question, how do you hold your team members accountable? <laughs> Okay. Uh, well, first of all, let me say, without meaning to be cryptic, you you, you can't make them be accountable. Um, yeah. However, 
uh, Lencioni says that that this particular competency, this particular behavior, is actually the most challenging one out of the whole lot. And part of the reason for that, or I guess the main reason for that, is that we are talking about peer-to-peer -peer accountability um, as opposed to the team leader holding um, people accountable. So this is developing the capacity on a team to be able to say, um, you know, hey, Joe, you said you were going to have me that research report by last Friday and I still don't have it. We made a commitment to this. What gives? Yeah. Um, so that's um, perennially difficult for, um, for team members to be able to um, well, let's just use the word confront each other yeah. in, in that way. So, yeah. um, again, one presumes, in, in answer to uh, Char's question, that uh, the team is, is building capacity um, as we go through each of the, uh, the competencies and we have, again, specific things that we work on um, in this uh, module, such as um, what are the differences in how people want to be held accountable so team members get to share this is how I like to be held accountable yeah. you know, if you have something to say to me this is how I will best receive it for, for example yeah <clears throat> Yeah, very good. And and wow, that our time has really flown by. We have about ten more minutes, so um, I want to ask this last little poll really quick here regarding in your work experience, have you seen projects suffer because people put their own needs ahead of the team's needs? What's how does that? Uh, impact results or affect results on a team, Annie? So again, we're talking about uh, this is the, the pinnacle of the, um, uh, the model and where everything builds towards is the ability for a team to, to deliver collective results. And one of the things that can derail that is if an individual team member is putting her or his own needs ahead of the team's needs or the, or the team's uh, uh, decisions about the results they're, they're going to create. So that might show up as, um, you know, my career goals or, um, you know, the team that I supervise, their needs, their goals. Um, it can show up in a, in a lot of different ways, but we're talking about a team being able to ultimately deliver collective results yeah. as, a, as a leadership team. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, that is a fair point. Um, and if we go back to our goal of making sure that folks take something away from our conversation today, um, how can a, a, a learning and development expert or a, a team lead get better results just through these dialogues? What would be your advice on that? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, concretely, one of the things that really helps uh, teams to uh, deliver collective results is to have their goals um, and their objectives um, highly visible uh, it, so that every time the team gets together, they're actually looking at it, whether it's on a screen or a wall or <laughs> some, you know, in the conference room, um, and, and that you know, every member of the team can see it. Uh, for example, they can do uh, a report out where they are in their particular, um, you know, uh, areas where they're helping to deliver uh, on the results. Uh, that, that would be, again, in the short time that we have a concrete thing um, yeah. that I've seen a lot of teams do that is really, really helpful. It yeah. immediately focuses the team on the collective results or goals. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's a, a very good uh, point. So here we go. So for the folks on the call, 94% have said yes in your work experience. You've seen projects suffer because people put their own needs. Uh, I think that's a, a pretty telling number, 94% perceive that other team members are putting their, their personal needs or their divisional needs or their operational needs ahead of the purpose of the team and, mm -hmm. and the work that needs to be done. Um, I think that says a lot about the the final five, fifth behavior of uh, the of this model. For the research, um, it was eighty seven percent. So um, for us on the call, ninety four percent, and the research said that eighty seven percent. So. Um, it, you know, no good webinar is ever really complete without a Steve Jobs quote, right? So. 
<laughs> great businesses are never done by one person. They're done by a team of people. And um, so in your experience of these behaviors and walking uh, a team through, what is it that why why is it important for a team to get a snapshot of where they are in regards to trust, conflict, commitment, accountability, and and how does the the assessment come up with these this input? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the short answer to how the assessment comes up with this is it's a series of very complex algorithms <laughs> based on um, how team members respond to the sets of questions in, in the assessment. And there's a, an extremely comprehensive research report that's been developed on it that um, certainly can, can be provided to anybody who wants to take a deep dive in, into that. Mm -hmm. Um, this is a, a, a snapshot of one of the pages from the report that uh, team members get, and uh, this is the uh, collect. This is a sample of the collective results of the, the how, how the team rated itself on mm -hmm. each of these um, different uh, competencies based on how they answered the questions, and we mm -hmm. see it up front. It's it it comes early in the report. And in, in my experience, um, it is rare for a, a team, first time out of the gate, to have any green. I mean, you can see here um, that uh, low, the ranges there, low is uh, represented in red, medium in yellow, and green in high. Um, and uh, so it's a sort of a, a, let me just call it a sobering moment for, for a team to, to see those results all in, in one place and, um, uh, in my experience anyway, highly motivating for, for yeah. the team yeah. um, because you can see from a, a fairly objective point of view uh, where a lot of the work needs to be done. Absolutely. And uh, how does the, the progress report support culture adoption? What is it about um, the comparison of when they first started the team development work and where they land in six months and 12 months and 18 months? What has your, been your experience with teams taking the model, really adopting it, and then seeing the results of whether or not they're making the progress they think. Well, it's a, it's a big celebration woohoo moment. I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's really, um, again, because we're, we're saying this is a meaty program. It, it takes work. It takes practice. We're, we're talking about changing behaviors. And to be able to see this, like this example here, this side-by-side -side comparison, you know, wow, we really, um, we, we really did some work. <laughs> and, and it's paying off. I mean, you know, look at that. And, and it also um, shows, hmm, now maybe this, in this particular example, of course, where the, the accountability is still, you know, in the low range, then we know uh, as, a, as a team, um, this is where we still have some pretty, um, pretty in-depth work to do in, in developing this competency. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I know we're coming up to the end of the hour, and for folks who've stayed with us, I want you to know that um, we will have the recording available, uh, and if we can go over just a few minutes, uh, we can talk a little bit more about why does the program use um, the DISC? Why is that important? How is that, or MBTI, the all types, why is that effective in this training? In, in a nutshell, what it, it let, let me just say, when I facilitated this program, uh, it's when this get this lands on the table that light bulbs really start going off for people. Interesting. Um, so uh, the the assessment and the report um, uh, allows people to know not only what their own uh, style preferences are, how they prefer to approach. Um, their work uh, and it lets people know how other people m might be different or, or similar to them. Mm -hmm. And so you know, we were talking earlier about that respect factor, so whether it's DISC or, or all types comes in in the trust module, um, we utilize it to, um, to increase um, not only people's understanding, respect and um, compassion for each other, uh, but also to start to um, build 
uh, trust by, mm -hmm. by taking, th taking how people behave out of the arena of the personal and, and putting it into, uh, 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 you just do things differently than I do. You, you approach it differently. And it's, it's not personal. It's just about your priorities and my priorities. Yeah? And it's all good. They're all, there's no such thing as a wrong <laughs> or a bad style. Uh, and, and so that, that really does, uh, it, it really does fuel, if I, if I can use that word, um, yeah. the power of the program. Yeah, I, I agree. And um, Bob Lorenzo has asked, is DISC like the Hogan or predictive in index assessments? Um, I'm going to go with no uh, on that. It it is um, the the DISC program is is based on um, well the four different styles that you can see there: dominance, influence, steadiness, and conscientiousness. That have uh, we're talking about behavior. So how how do we prefer to behave in in the workplace? And um, of, of course, diving into that is a, an exploration of the differences in those kinds of style preferences, as, yeah. as opposed to MBTI, for example, which is much more about personality, much more hardwired. Yes. Um, the yes. disc is more about your and priority preferences. Yes. Yes, and um, I know that we are over time, but I did want to address Shar's question very quickly. Do we have a train the trainer? And we do have a train the trainer. Um, it's through the Wiley um, system. We're happy to give us a call. We can talk to you about that. Um, we also have uh, organizational development experts. Um, Annie has facilitated this program with a number of organizations around the country. Um, and we're happy to, to just do a complimentary consult, co consultation on your team needs whether or not this is a program that's a good fit. I can promise you this. If I do not think that your team is a good fit for this, um, we absolutely can um, present some other options. But I, I, this is we do not use this as a one-size-fits-all um, because it is a pretty intensive process. And a team kind of has to be ready for this kind of work. Um, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, absolutely. So in, in uh, summation, um, Annie, I'd love to hear, I, I included the two case studies um, for us mm. to talk about. Um, one was the six-month program that Microsoft Business Solutions went through, and long story short, um, they used the model in a greater group of, of team members in order to um, move from a situation where they had um, the leader had adopted a team, they were pretty set in their ways, there was some discord, dysfunction, and disengagement. Um, and after going through the process, they really began to trust one another through the dialogue of just hearing each other's stories. Um, and the one piece that I remember about this particular case study uh, was the accountability factor, the mm -hmm. ability to hold one another accountable. Uh, and as a part of their team culture, um, shifted their effectiveness as a team. Um, yeah, the absolutely. other, you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the other case study that we probably don't really have a whole lot of time for, but was in, um, I have maybe 10 different case studies, um, that, but one of the ones that I found uh, pretty impressive was the Lee Memorial case study, mm -hmm. who became one of America's 50 best hospitals. They used the five behaviors of a cohesive team. They had incredible customer service and high level um, uh, patient care uh, survey results but their team results were very down. Um, team members and employees were disengaged, unhappy at work, uh, felt drained at work, um, and the HR surveys indicated that they their, their teams needed attention. Yeah. And um, they still use it to this day and have said that it's transformed their culture that years after, going through the process of adapting and, and modeling the five behaviors that the, that the organizational culture um, uh, that other members, uh, other executives and employees from other departments now go to this department, it's the radiology department, <laughs> to see what they're up to and how they're doing it. Yeah. So, pretty powerful uh, stuff. Pretty yeah. powerful. Um, Annie, how would, you, how would you like to leave it? So, two things that I really always hope to accomplish is one, I want folks to be able to take something away that they can use, and two, um, if you guys have questions, if uh, don't 
the way that we operate at Turnkey is um, I'm here to, to offer support. It's what I love to do. It's what my team loves to do. Whether or not we're a good fit and a match um, for you to do business with us is something completely separate. So if you found information in here helpful but you have further questions, don't hesitate to, to send us an email or pick up the phone. We're, we're glad to help. And Annie, for you, what what's your takeaway of, you now that you've used this model? Um, in organizations, and now you've had a chance to see what the results are like even years later. Um, what's your takeaway that, that you'd like to share? Well, I, I, this is, I have two top favorite leadership tools, and, and this is one of them, um, it, for de design for teams. I have seen it work um, like the case, and by the way, the case studies are available. If people want to get their hands on those, they can contact you, Anissa, and, and get copies of the case study. Absolutely. Um, so just know that those are available and they're really interesting. Uh, it, I've seen this work absolute miracles on, on, a, on a team. I, um, I had one team that the team leader came up to me after uh, we did one day um, on uh, introducing the model, the disc, and, and trust, and she came up to me uh, at the end of the day, and her eyes were kind of misty, and she said, wow, she said, you have just really given me new hope for my team, and wow. and so, yeah, so for me as a facilitator, like, wow, super great moment, and, and um, let me be clear that it is the team that ultimately makes this work, and that particular team, um, they their whole pyramid was red when we started. It was a very like um, very disappointing moment for them um, when that landed on the table. In uh, a year, they turned that team around. Um, they uh, created a uh, culture, a five behaviors culture on their team. Um, and even when they were bringing in new members, they in, they were um, you know. They were told this is this is the culture you're going to be expected to operate in, um, and they within a year they turned their whole pyramid green. Wow, yeah, That's impressive. <laughs> very. And but it, it, again, they really they really they had did to do a lot of work. work. They did yeah. the work. Yeah, I've certainly seen um, organizations that have gone from red to yellow <laughs> and a few greens. Um, I will look forward to the day where I see a team go all the way to the green. Oh, the green, yeah. Um, <laughs> It's rare because it does take so much work, and um, but I, I am so I've learned so much, Annie, um, and um, for everyone that was on the call, we value your time. It was a pleasure to have you with us today, and Annie, thank you so much. That was a lot of fun. I hope we get to do it again. Absolutely, thank you. Great thank to be you. here. And uh, David Whitmarsh with the Whitmarsh Consulting Group, and Leanne, we thank you as well for sponsoring the event today, and appreciate you. So thank you, everyone. Let us know how we can support you.